Welcome back to the Theater Podcast, intimate personal conversations with the industry's biggest names. I am your host, Ellen Seals. This episode is with Laura Bell Bundy, who, if you don't know her, she's just a goofball. I love her. I love talking with her. We've actually been working pretty closely together over the last year or so on her own podcast, Women of Tomorrow, also on the Broadway Podcast Network. It is a deep dive into women's history and women's rights and equality and the topics that we all just need to be talking about right now. She and her writing partner, Shay Carter, also just dropped their brand new album, Women of Tomorrow, Coincidentally, the same name as their podcast, which is an amazing dive into all of the topics aforementioned. This conversation you're about to listen to is just refreshingly honest. It's amazing. Laura Bell is so funny. And I know I said it at the beginning, but she's just a goofball. She likes to talk about poop. So, you know, we're kindred spirits. On a serious note, we do talk about sexual assault and domestic violence. So there is a little bit of a trigger warning here in case that affects you. Before we get into this, please find me online on Instagram and Twitter at theater underscore podcast. Leave a rating, leave a review, hit that follow button, that like button, whatever you can do to help spread the word and keep the podcast going. Now, please enjoy this episode with Laura Bell Bundy. Here you go. One, two, three. I actually normally start our, my interviews with like reading this whole bio and introducing the guest and kind of setting up the interview and this interview is going to be completely different i just want to start talking because literally <laughs> i went to your your website and i was like okay what can i pick out i'm gonna write this bio and it's just too freaking much to introduce so i'm going to record all this separately i haven't decided how i'm going to introduce you yet but okay okay <laughs> but i i <laughs> wanted to say of course welcome to the theater I podcast give you highlights <laughs> well, I want to I want to start with with the beginning. I I've known you for a while and uh, it as most is happening uh as is happening with most people that I get to know in the last year and a half. I've gotten to know a lot of people in this space and I've never met them in person yet because of hashtag #covid. But right. I know a lot about you. I know a lot about what you're into and obviously know you offline and for what I can read online and I didn't know about your origin story of winning your <laughs> what is it miss southern miss northern hemisphere miss peewee hemisphere no, that's what it's, it's called hemisphere just the hemisphere there's no northern or southern the just the hemisphere it's just winning miss hemisphere right so yeah. you're miss a native peewee. of kentucky people obviously know you as l woods from from legally blonde and and your other broadway credit, credits and like a hundred million TV credits. It's insane. But you do so much. You do producing. You have your own production company. You have all of these things. And you're akin to my heart in that I feel like you just can't sit still. And on top of all of that, you come from the South. I do too. And then you wanna, you're want you adding social justice to all of it. And so your album, Women of Tomorrow, just came out. And it's all about breaking the glass ceiling, women's empowerment, and it goes along with the Women of Tomorrow podcast of the same name, which I run the sessions for you. And I have learned so much by doing doing these sessions, being in these things with you and you and your, your partner, Shay Carter, the two of you are phenomenal. And I've talked a lot. I want to ask a question here. All right. So we're going to talk about all this stuff. But tell me about tell me, tell us, who, all of us listening now, in your own words, like, how did you just get into this crazy damn business and how do you do so much? I got into this business because my mom put me in a pageant when I was five. Now, before, the reason that she put me in a pageant was um, her sister had won Miss Kentucky and was semifinalist in Miss America. And and my aunt had like taught herself to sing and play the piano. And my grandfather was a singer and my mom was not. It was very much a Mama Rose story, like Southern Mama Rose. She's like, I don't have the talent, but my child does. And I'm going to make her a star, you know, that kind of thing. Um, except with a Southern accent, you know. And so she put me in this pageant and I, I won the local. And then I go to the state level. I win. And I go to the national level, so which local, is local hemisphere. And then local, state hemisphere, local, and then you know, eventually you're getting county of 
Kentucky, and then and then the Little Miss Pee Wee Hemisphere <laughs> of Kentucky, and then just Little Miss Pee Wee Hemisphere. And I and I won a new car, uh, F five. Yeah, don't really know what the thought process was in there. My mom was like, "We'll take the money." <laughs> I remember it being a hideous <laughs> car. It was hideous. Then shortly after. Uh, a couple months later, my mom gets this call from the pageant director saying the Phil Donahue show, which was, you know, these types of shows, Sally, Jesse, mm-hmm. Raphael, Geraldo, Phil Donahue, Oprah at the time, they were all doing these panel shows. And we were invited. We were going to get an all expense paid trip to New York City. We were like, let's go to Kmart and get some new clothes. My mom had a dress <laughs> made for me just for the occasion. And um, and so we go. I stay at the Sheridan Hotel on 7th Avenue. It's very exciting. The Lindy's is right down the way, and I think it's still there. And I had cheesecake. And then we get to the show, and it turns out it's an expose on children's pageants. They didn't and tell you this. They, no, no. We think it's a celebration of pageants. I've got my runway walk down. You should see. I have video of this. I'm doing my runway walk. I turn around. Then they have these moms on the stage. They bring on a child psychologist. And they've got these people in the audience like, I can't believe you're doing this to your daughter. You're like, it's so ridiculous. Look at her, blah, 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 blah. And they're all just sort of turning on all the mothers. And my mom was not on the stage. She was in the audience. And she stands up to d- defend herself. And then I reach for Phil Donahue's mic. I'm five. I look like John Bonet. I'm I was like a gay man trapped in the body of John Bonet. So I'm like grabbing the microphone and he's like, this little girl would like to say something. So I then I defend my mom and I'm like, I like pageants. I like modeling. I like the game. <laughs> you know? And and then I and I and they and they laughed at me. They laughed at me. And there's like footage of this one woman doing like a wind up toy thing. And of course, I'm sure my mom coached me. Well, I'm sure she definitely coached me like what to say. Um, and now I know the feeling that I had in that moment. Now I've identified it as shame. At the time, I just felt real icky. And uh, I think that was the first time I experienced shame. But my mom was like, you know, let's shine this turd. And, um, or as my dad said, let's turn chicken shit into chicken salad. Oh. And she. Oh. That's a horrible analogy. <laughs> and that's good. You know, that's good with some iced tea, See, some sweet tea. Sweet tea and neck. some, and some pig shit, some chicken shit. <laughs> so, I, so I'm little. My mom is like, Waltz is my little took us all the way over to Ford Modeling Agency, which is like 59th Street and 1st Avenue, which is very far away from 7th Avenue, wherever we were. And uh, we go in. I remember it being kind of a gray, gloomy, rainy day. And she says, I'm here to see the children's division. And there's a guy at the front and he's like, "Um, ma'am, do you have an appointment? And she's like, well, no. But this is Miss Pee Wee Hemisphere, and um, we're leaving tomorrow. So if they're going to meet her, they're going to need to meet her now. And he's like, okay. So he calls and has his own, you know, probably like, there's a crazy lady down here. Yeah, the kid's okay. (laughs) (laughs) Sends us up, and they sign me to a five-year contract. Seriously, right? Like, they just just say sight unseen or they they just look at you and no, they're like they okay see they'll me. sign her up they see me and i think my mom had like some you know portfolio or something that she was showing them of pictures of me like this is her here this is where she won the car this is here this is her dancing you know and then i i remember them having me like you know stand straight turn profile and maybe something else and ask me a couple questions and i probably did some modeling poses or something cuz i I was pretty physical as a kid in terms of like, I think I had a little ADD and that's why like I was, you know, my mom had me in dance. And I mean, literally, this was like a, d- a day in the life of me at five was like your dance lesson, your singing lesson, your piano lesson, your tennis lesson, your swimming lesson, your, it was like your gymnastics lesson. Your, it was just so many things all the time. And um, and then I guess what I really loved was singing and dancing and um, and connecting with people. So I and modeling was like, eh, 
it was fine. But so I ended up getting this modeling contract. My mom was like, we live in Kentucky. I don't know how we're going to do this. And so they said, well, you can be what's called a summer kid and just come for the summers. And uh, so I would go to school in, in Kentucky. And in the summer, I would come to New York. And I would also train with different singing teachers and go to Broadway Dance Center. I had a little Broadway Dance Center card when I was six years old. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> and I would go to these adult classes and like do do my, you know, where they have like the basic classes. My mom would put me in the basics, but it was like all, it was just me and a bunch of adults. And, and but mostly adults that didn't speak English. Right after this event at the Ford Modeling Agency where we signed the contract, we leave. We don't have any money. So it's probably got, we got a hot dog on the street or something. And my mom was like, we're going to go see a Broadway show. So she went to the... She went to the ticket booth of the Palace Theater and said, uh, what's your cheapest and best ticket? (laughs) (laughs) They put us in a box uh, and I saw Starlight Express, which was my first Broadway show. So on the same day of that Phil Donahue show, I got a contract with Ford Modeling Agency and my career began and I saw my very first Broadway show. Wow. And I guess that's when you got the acting bug or whatnot. And I'm reading in your bio here, too, that at age nine, you had your stage debut at Radio City Music Hall. It's interesting to me because the preconceived notion I have of the pageant kid is it is, I guess, coming coming from money, really. It's like the affluent parents that are just like, I'm going to continue the legacy and make sure that my child is better than everything that I've, right? And you're shaking your head, making a funny face. Obviously, that is not the case. No. It's a bunch of moms living through their daughters wanting to win prize money. Oh, I guess that makes sense. Yes. And And who have had, I think, you know, I will say this in the South, uh, culturally, um, you know, the 50s and 60s, it was customary for women to be in beauty competitions um, because the focus was on our outer beauty, not on our brains. But what happened is with certain, um, certain pageants, scholarship money was available. Like for the Miss America pageant, scholarship money was available only to go to college. And that's why my aunt did it. And she had a full ride to go to school when she won. And so I think for my mom, sort of that thinking was a part of it. Like, maybe we can afford to send our daughter to college one day, but maybe she could also earn it herself by traipsing around in a bikini at five. (laughs) (laughs) So messed up. But but I will say it did instill in me, uh, you know, uh, confidence. I was, I I almost said competition, and definitely it did that too. Um, (laughs) Confidence and a sense of uh, healthy competition, right? So I I won. And when you win at a very young age, you think you can win other things in life. And it gave me that belief. Um, Now I look back and I go, yeah, I peaked at five. But... um, (laughs) Yeah, but but really, like, I think it did instill in me some confidence. And then, of course, with the Phil Donahue situation, them turning on us, I was like, wait a minute. You guys don't love me? You're critiquing me? What I'm doing is wrong? How is this? How should I feel? Why should I feel ashamed that I look cute and I can turn around like this? You know, so there there was a lot of mixed things, but I, I got a lot of information. You know, I learned a lot at that time very fast and then we went to new york and we didn't have any money and we're living there in the summer and we're staying the rat hole the roach hole with the russian lady who i think was in the cia i don't know what was going on but it was very weird we would find her in the closet sometimes sleeping yeah what (laughs) these are the like we have to get sublet apartments every time we came to new york in the summer and you just and and she was sleeping in the closet yeah (laughs) yeah my mom yeah, just we found some just crazy things. Like once, well, this was a two bedroom, two bathroom apartment. The woman wanted two thousand dollars for the summer, and my mom was like, "I only have a thousand dollars," and she's like, "Yeah, well, maybe I can." She didn't say it like that. She was like, "Lisa, maybe I can have you come stay here. I come come every once in a while. I stay at house a couple times in the summer." So she wouldn't tell us 
when she was coming, she'd just show up, <laughs> open up the coat closet and she'd be sleeping on like an air mattress in a in her coat closet or something. And uh and then one time my mom lip, lifted up the mattress of uh that she she was sleep well, she was hearing things like crunchy sound. She uh lifted up the mattress and there was just a bunch of um condom wrappers oh, underneath. God. Oh. Yeah, now not condoms, just wrappers. Okay, but I guess you know they were going there, and my mom wasn't sure what was going on in that house. You know, I mean, in that apartment, and oh, I have so many stories. That's so many stories. It sounds like you, know, you said you picked at five, and you you know you felt shame and all that, and and all of a sudden realize that you're not as awesome as everyone's made you out to be. Most people go through yeah. that. Most people go through that in their like mid 20s maybe around 30 or whatnot like you did that at such a young age that i feel like that explains so much about you what i know about you now because you're just like unapolog unapologetically just like fuck it i'm me take it or leave it i don't care and i think that's you know that's like the 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 older 60 70 year old people who who have had that experience in life who are just like whatever i'm, I'm old and i get it and nothing matters anymore you've already like you're your emotional shame happened at such a young age that now you're just like, whatever, whatever. I don't care. I don't care. I'm just going to do it. Right? There's also, yeah, I, I think maybe there's also so many, um, you know, when you're a young person and you're auditioning, there's so many have to be's, right? You have to be this and you have to be that and you have to be this in order to get the job or in order for people to like you. And at some point that just becomes totally exhausting. And you realize what really matters is not only um, being who you are, but that's really the only way you're going to connect. You're, that's the only way you're going to connect with the material, with the with the director, the casting, with any, the audience, with anybody is a feeling of truth and instead of a lot of pretense. And uh, so that's why I just gave up that other. A lot of people, a lot of people. I gave maybe, all that other horse shit. <laughs> a lot of people may never get that though, because even speaking for myself too, going into auditions, I would go in and do what I thought the casting director wanted. And I thought, like you said a second ago, you, it's, everybody wants you to be this and wants you to do that. And, but I, but the people that I've seen now, you know, I'm 40, the people that I've seen now and the peers at this level, the ones that have talked to me about their success and how they really got there are the ones who just like literally just said, I'm going to go in, I'm making my choices. I'm being bold. I'm going to do me. I'm going to do my truth. And then that fits the part. And you know, you hear, uh, you hear all the time that the part was people come out of auditions and they say, I lost the job. I screwed it up. And then, and then I think it was Michael Yuri told me the job was never yours. You know, right. how do you, how do you think you lost it? It was never yours. It right. was, it didn't belong to you. So you go and you do your thing. And I, all I'm just trying to say is that I think you have, you had a very young age obtained a sense of self awareness, I guess that some people even now at our age still don't have. Well, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, listen, I take it as a compliment because I think self-awareness is the uh, most important thing for people to have. And I also ha ha have to say, too, that I get angry with myself for not being more self-aware. Like, I think that's kind of what the journey of life is, is becoming more self-aware. I mean, there's plenty of times where I have a total lack of awareness. I wake it up in the morning and, I'm, you know, and I'm making noise and my husband's still sleeping or that's more, that's more that happens at night. He's already <laughs> asleep. And it's him waking up in the morning doing that. But there, those are, you know, those, those just like thoughtfulness and self-awareness and especially now during a time of great change and um, <clears throat> resistance uh, and the persistence of resistance, it's so important to be self-aware, but it's hard to know what you don't know. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's like, that's important too, is to have a sense or just to have an awareness that you don't know it all. And there's so much more to learn. And you're going to get to be surprised, which is great. 
You know what one of my biggest fears is, is, is that my brain, like studies have shown, right? Around your mid thirties to late thirties into your forties, your brain starts to calcify and you oh. literally lose the ability to form new synapses. You literally lose the ability to form new synapses and essentially you lose the ability to learn. And that's one of my biggest, biggest fears. And part of the reason why I'm always trying to do new things and even challenging yourself to brush your teeth with the opposite hand, just do something different, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Do something that's going to make your brain go, hold on a second. I don't need to calcify here. This isn't automatic anymore. So I, I'm always looking for those little opportunities to like take a different route than something I've walked before or brush, try to brush my teeth with my non-dominant hand every now and then to keep my, you know, keep my brain from, from getting lazy. And to so, keep your teeth rotting away. <laughs> I can't, can't get the back teeth. I don't know. I forgot about this molar. <laughs> well, then, okay. So talking about the self-awareness, I want to bring that to Women of Tomorrow and the whole album and the podcast and everything, the description, you know, it says it was born out of the 2016 election. And just the, uh, just the, well, I guess, have you, you explain it as to why, why all of a sudden, was it like a light switch or was it something gradual where you decided like, I actually need to start learning about this or I'm just not okay with it anymore. And then how did that translate into what became Women of Tomorrow? Well, there is a light switch for sure. There was a moment where I went, holy crap, have I been living under a rock? Why do I feel like we are, as women, collectively hitting a glass ceiling together? Um, When the election was going on between Hillary and Donald Trump. And part of it was just seeing the way that she was treated in the media versus him. The way that she had to behave in order to be considered serious versus him. Um... Her ability, her background, all of the work that she had done to get to that place versus him having really not done anything. Mm -hmm. And some of that was just so mind-blowing to me. And I understand that the the party that he was, uh, was, was going for felt like they had been betrayed by the government. And, um, and so there was almost like an acceptance of the fact that he wasn't qualified. Um, they, that was like, that was a good thing. But to me, that was really glaring where you have this person who might've been the most qualified person ever to be president being treated in a way like, oh, she's wearing this, her hair, her voice is shrill, you know, just things like that where the comp that she's acting bossy, uh, she's not smiling enough. She's smiling too much. Like these things have nothing to do with her ability to do the job properly. Right. And some of that stuff really bothered me. The double standard became glaring. And, um, you know, it's interesting, like as an actress, I'm always like, up against women. I'm very rarely up against men for the same role. So I don't see as much of that. Um, I don't get a in in my world uh, for as an actor or as a singer. What I what I can say is that the juicy meaty roles um, up until recently were always written for men um, or uh, the substantial ones or ones that weren't based on being a sex object or a dumb blonde or a whatever whatever. Though those types of roles would be really it would be awesome if there were more for women and there are. Um, more being written for women. So that that was some of the things I was realizing. But then I did this concert called Double Standards. It spot, it made me, it inspired me to have this idea, uh, that moment where I did a concert that was like, you know, the Broadway gals version of a women's march where <laughs> um, two female singers would come together to sing a duet on a jazz standard all in the name of women's rights and women's health. And we raised over a hundred thousand dollars. We did it at the town hall um, for ACLU Planned Parenthood and the national breast cancer coalition um, because it was for women's rights and health. And I started to, I decided to do little tidbits about women and women's history in the intros. 
And I was overwhelmed at the things that I was finding out that I didn't know. Like it wasn't until 1974 that a woman could take out a credit card without the permission of her husband or her father. 74. 74. Yeah. 74. That was seven years before I was born. No wonder my mom felt like she had to get married early. When was when was the date that that um, that birth control became legal for non-married couples? In 1972, uh, single women, unmarried couples, could legally obtain birth control, and that included the birth control pill, which also uh, had been available for married couples since 1965. And research to make a pill had been underway for, I think, 60, 50, 60 years. So this, these facts, facts like these, uh, were really overwhelming to me. Things that I didn't know. And the women that had to fight for these rights that I currently have, I completely took for granted. And that are threatened of, at, at the threat of being taken away again. At the threat of being taken away, for yes. sure. Um, I think collectively as women, we were very, a, a lot of women, a lot of progressive women were very afraid when Donald Trump got elected because um, of an awareness that these rights that we have, these freedoms that we enjoy now were not a given. They were fought for. People lost everything for them. And so they're not a given they can be taken from us at any time. And uh, I think that that he sort of represented a misogynistic, sexist, a patriarchy at its finest. And so that's where I think a lot of that uprising began. And, you know, to just talk about openly sexually assaulting a woman is very scary. And if a person is going to be the leader of the land uh, saying something like that, how many other people think that's acceptable? Well, the, your, your episode one of a Women with Tomorrow podcast, it, it, you and Shay went into the history like so, so, so deep. And I'm not going to ask you to repeat any of it now. And I want everyone listening to go and, you know, check out episode one of Women of Tomorrow. Um, we'll link to, we'll link to the podcast in the show notes for this episode. But it, like every time I record with the two of you, uh, I am floored. And your episode one guest, by the way, was Amy McGrath, who was running against Mitch McConnell for U.S. Senate. Unfortunately, she did not win. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> but at the time, she was still a candidate. And and just like for me, this this seems like very obvious stuff that like, why can't everyone choose for themselves? And this is this is my ignorance as a cis white man, not ever having to deal with not having these choices or being unable to choose for myself, right? I just assumed that everyone else had the same freedoms that I did. And that's my right. fault that I am now learning. So I, I enjoy so much sitting in with the se on, on the sessions with you and Shay and learning everything that you have and hearing from all your guests. And just the, the interview with Anika Nani Rose is still sitting with me because as a woman of color, a Disney princess, of color she's mm -hmm. got her own set of standards that have been placed on her a right. and and then inside the broadway community and we all know what's going on now with the scott rudin shit and the the, the march on broadway and you know the, all how it all ties into lack of diversity and lack of equity and like there is so much now that is coming out of new york and coming out of movements that are started by people like you that are now filtering out to the rest of the world and you started it you started it a long time ago and i think this goes this goes to um uh, uh, well let's bring this back to your album right because every song is focusing on a different topic in a lack of rights or or women's equity or whatnot right so mm -hmm. every different track is something specific is tackling something specific yeah we're we're Every song is dealing with an issue that women are facing today, whether that be breaking the glass ceiling, doing it all, meaning doing too much, the mental load, um, uh, motherhood, uh, equal pay, consumerism and unattainable beauty standards, obsession with social media, our relationship to men 
and the way men treat us. We tactfully and musically (laughs) tackle sexual assault with a song called Red Rover. Now all of this is in music and you hear it and it sounds like it's this sort of big band jazzy uh, sound, like almost like it sounds like an classic MGM movie musical with modern elements. It feels very dreamy. But the topics that we're talking about are very modern and in fact, sometimes quite shocking. And some of it is a celebration, like Get a Girl You Go is a celebration of how far we've come and breaking the glass ceiling. But then there are other songs that like Digital Disease or Red Rover that are haunting. Um, And then our cover we did of Girls Just Want to Have Fun, which deals with the video deals with domestic violence against women because um, one in five women experience domestic violence in their lifetime. Actually, no, one in four women. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's more. Violence in their lifetime. Yeah. Well, it's domestic violence, and I think it's, is it, yeah, one in four experiences domestic violence, one in three is sexually assaulted. I think that's the stat. I think one in five. One in five. It's, it's, well, it's too, it's too high, whatever it is. It didn't happen the way, (laughs) the way, uh, the way that we see that. We're going to take a short break. Stay tuned for more of the episode. I gotta say, you know, it's interesting, like I, I set out, I was passionate. I think I was passionate because I really think women are awesome. Yeah. Like I've never, I've never really met a woman who couldn't do what they were asked to do in five other tasks at the same time and then see them do that. And then I trust that the job is going to get done. And um, I think my appreciation of women uh, throughout my lifetime is definitely grown. And then after becoming a mom, it's grown more. A wife and a mom, it's grown more in terms of the expectations that have been put on women that I felt being put on me as well, as as well as the responsibilities that I have in raising another human being and the way that my biology works in order to do that. I was like, whoa, we are pretty incredible. There is nothing weak about this sex. Like you try to push a baby out of your penis. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Uh. Oh, so there are some things like that. Like I'm just amazed at the power of the female body and the fact that it's been labeled or that someone could call someone as an insult a pussy. Like, oh, you're a pussy. I'm like, wow, that's a compliment. Well, do you know you. what this thing can do? <laughs> this is pretty strong. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I've just felt I started to feel very, uh, very um, passionate about the power of women and wanting women to feel the power that they have. And half of the stuff that I began to tackle and write about, or that we talk about on the podcast, you know, some of those things I know, and some of those I'm learning as I go. And a part of it is my own research about my own gender. And I really did become obsessed with women's history. I love women's history. I love to investigate it. It wasn't taught in, uh, in my education growing up. I mean, there's a couple of women you always hear about. And the way that they are recorded in history is also really interesting, too. Like we, anything we hear about Cleopatra, it's very sexualized. Um, and she was actually pretty dowdy in real life. But it's just more exciting when a woman is like, um, you know. It's like she can't be powerful without being pretty. When we talk about her boobs. That's what we want. We want right. to talk about her boobs. <laughs> Not about her brains. <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's that's very interesting. I I like she can't be pretty. She can't be successful without being pretty. The two just can't coexist in history. Or you know, there's all these kind of uh, c- comments like when we when we when we talk about a woman negatively, we tend to go to her appearance or her sexuality. Like we we either say she was a whore or she was frumpy. And uh, it's always got to go back to a woman's appearance and desirability. It always goes back to that, even in the media. Like even yeah. when we're talking about a politician, it always goes back to that. Like if she's less 
de- less desirable than well, like it's an insult to be less desirable. So you call her words that therefore have the connotation of being less desirable. Right. And it's also an insult if she's too desirable. So that's so just then be- she's a whore. So there's no way. It's it's a double bind. It's a double bind. There's no way. It's just it's the way that we the way that things have been set up. The way that things have been set up for years and years and years is about desirability. And some of that comes from basic biology. Listen, procreation, women are uh, the creators. We birth the human race. Um, There are different biological things of attraction, you know, finding a mate and then having uh, offspring. And that kind of makes the world go around. But what we've done or what society has done in terms of selling this idea about a woman's value is that the only value is in the desirability and in the birthing, right? Uh, And that's it. And so she should just be kept quiet until she's ready to go from being her father's property to her husband's property and then her sons. You know, it's just that's and that's how things operated for for forever, unless you oh. were lucky enough to stay single and run a whorehouse and then you had some power. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, because sex is power. <laughs> um what what is I forget the other stat. There's another stat that you that you've mentioned in your podcast too, that it's that it when I don't know if you remember this off the top of your head, of when women were able to own their own gifts. Yeah, so that was 1848, uh, the Married Women's Property Act. Women, prior to that, the laws of coverture, which came from England, were the norm, where not only was a woman considered the property of her husband and her or her father, right? So from her father, then became the property of her husband, and any of her property uh, would then be controlled by her husband. So if she made any money or received any gifts, it was going to be controlled and handled by her husband. But the, in this uh, Married Women's Property Act of 1848, the laws changed. Women were allowed to earn and control their own wage, receive and keep their own gifts and decide what they were going to do with them. And uh, they were also given uh, shared custody of their children. So in the event of the death of their husband, they could could control what happened to their children, whereas before it would go to like the nearest male relative. And then I guess in a rare, rare case of divorce in 1848, which was definitely not the norm, a woman did have some rights. But prior to that, women did not have custody to the children they gave birth to. That's insane. And especially because it didn't used to be like that. And I, I forget... I forget if it was through you or something else that I heard that it was like the, what was it? The invention of, of farms and crops. Like oh, that was definitely probably our podcast. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that Because everything, when everybody went out together and everything was equal, right. it was an equal right. male and female society. It was, yeah. It was egalitarian society. Men did the, the hunting and women did the gathering because they were often nursing. And so it was easier for them to do that. Um, but there were some there were some group hunting activities as well with an entire tribe uh, together. And these are sort of nomadic tribal societies, uh, I would say like 200,000 years ago, maybe up until, oh, I don't know, 25,000. I don't know how, how when it was. But so we were hunter-gatherers. And because women were gathering nuts and seeds, it's believed that women were the ones who noticed that the seeds would then grow the plants to grow more fruit and more crop. So they created farming. And then um, because of this food and the availability of the food, um, it wasn't as necessary to hunt, but also they had to stay in one place. So these lands had to be cultivated and they also had to use animals to cultivate. So the men would then be then be like training the oxen and that this type of thing to help with the farming and uh, and 
and all of that. And the land, because they were doing this, this le- this level of labor on the farm in the one place, they considered the land theirs. And that was the moment that women became came inside and were doing the weaving and were taking the crops and turning it into to the food and the flour and things like this. Um, and her job became in the house and the land became his. And to ensure that this land was going to be passed down to his own children, he needed to guarantee the virginity of the woman that he had children with. Make sure his, the kids were his. Because prior to that, like, nobody really knew. There, there, like, there are accounts very, very early on of women being regarded as goddesses because they did not know how babies came to be. They did not know that women had ovaries and men had sperm and that's how it worked. They did not know that. They just were like, and she's growing and she will give birth and she is a goddess. <laughs> she created this child all on her own. And so she was regarded in that way. So if you see stories have been collected, and listen, all I want to say about anybody who's like Adam and Eve and Adam came first, was it the chicken or the egg? The chicken is always a female. That's true. So I am of the belief that the first human was a woman. Because how else would the rest of, you know, the logic, <laughs> the scientific logic? It's There's just in the research that I've done in terms of the history that I've seen, uh, the history that I've read, and there's a lot of things written to control women. There's so many stories, uh, whether that be biblical or mythological, that are used to control women and to guarantee the passing down of money. Money. And this is what I'm seeing now. It literally makes my stomach churn, the realizations that I'm having about our country um, and the problems that we have really come from greed. Women's inability to have rights come from greed. Yeah. The, yeah. the people of color's inability to have rights comes from greed. And the people that are doing this and not seeing this go to a church every Sunday, put their hand on the Bible and don't see the connection. That greed built the country they live in and greed is the root of our problem. Greed is why women didn't have rights, you know? And we're talking mostly, as we're saying these dates of things that have that have happened, it's primarily been focused on white women, too. So women of color have it yeah. that much harder. Absolutely. Um, we have to be really careful, and it's really hard because history is written by the people who win history, um, which has historically been straight white men. Um, and, and the way that history is written, you know, you just, if you don't have power, you don't get yourself written into the history books and people don't, people don't necessarily notice your accomplishments. In 1848, we were dealing with entirely different issues when it came to people of color. We celebrate women getting the right to vote in 1920, but women of color did not have the right to vote until 1965. Right. And here's something that I just learned from our podcast we did about money that I thought was really interesting. There was the the Mother's Welfare Act in the 20s because women had begun to get into the workforce, uh, especially shortly at the end of the 1800s and the ability to own, uh, I mean, sorry, yes, the ability to own property and earn a living wage. And so women were in the workplace. There began to be union organization. And then there were also very poor uh, single mothers who were eligible for the Women's Welfare Act. But black women were not eligible for that. So if you were a black woman who had children the assumption was that you were going to work. What was happening with their children? And the other thing is that after the end of the Civil War, when Black people were trying to figure out how to earn a living wage 
and uh, how they were going to acclimate into society, which the, the Reconstruction was terribly reconstructed. It was awful. We know that we these problems persist today. And now we're hoping for a new Reconstruction. What was happening is that Black men were less likely to be hired than white men. And so Black women were forced to also work. So this was a uh, two-parent income mm-hmm. for, I mean, most, I would say, uh, I think it was 40% of Black mothers were working. Wow. And they were working basically in domestic service, so taking care of white women's children. <laughs> <laughs> And those jobs, historically and to this day, do not have benefits. Yes. They do not have paid sick leave. We could go. We could go on. There's. There's always the different. You always have to. It's. I found that it's very hard to get the information. You really have to go down rabbit holes to find. You have to do your research. And I certainly hope that I'm giving fair and balanced history (laughs) lessons on the podcast. It's always a struggle. And I wish that this stuff was taught in school so that we could feel like we had a a really strong sense of our history in totality. Well, there's just, there's just not enough time to teach everything. And I, I agree that something needs to be taught, right? And it comes, it's regional, it's regional history, because wherever you're from, they teach your local state history or, you know, North Carolina. No joke. My seventh grade social studies teacher presented the facts, I put in air quotes, of the Holocaust and asked us to decide for ourselves if it actually happened. What? In seventh grade public school. And then in high school, there was a giant picture of Jesus in the library. Again, public school, North Carolina. I mean, I think that uh, uh, the social media age and the internet age, of course, is bringing everyone closer together and we're able to find things and connect more. But, you know, look at our parents, this, these generations of people who didn't leave, they didn't travel, or maybe they didn't have the fee- the funds or whatnot. And mm-hmm. maybe they just never knew an actual gay person or an actual trans person or, an a- or you know, you just read about these things and their stories. And again, History is written by the victors. If you hear a story about someone who doesn't like them, then that's your that's your view of them. That's your view exactly. of who these other people are. Exactly. So, again, I guess what I was trying to say is, is I don't know how on earth, and we're not going to solve it in this conversation, but how on earth we could possibly learn everything we need to learn. I mean, they don't even teach cursive in schools anymore. <laughs> right? Well, I... This is well, this kind of goes back to what you were saying before about our brains calcifying. Okay. In our 30s and 20s. Uh, and I think that's happening because we think we go to college and we've learned everything we need to know. We've picked our trade, we're good at it, and we don't have to learn anymore. And I remember reading something when I dropped out of college. I didn't know you dropped out of college. Yes, I dropped out of college. That that being an educated person is being a well-read person is continuing to educate yourself. And I think maybe my feelings of inadequacy about not having a college education and my father always wanting me to have one has made me lean into more my personal growth and this and and my absorbing more knowledge and information throughout my life. And Man, there is so much to learn. There is so much that we don't know. And like we were saying about growing up in North Carolina, listen, I grew up in Kentucky. Thank God I came to New York when I came to New York. And I was exposed to so much culture. And I had personal relationships with people who were gay, Asian, black, Dying of AIDS, I saw with my own eyes my my first singing teacher die of AIDS. Mm. And so my understanding of the complexity of life and people who come from different backgrounds and origins and socioeconomic differences, like I, I have a very different view than my friends that were raised 
in the one small town and never left. And yet I still am that girl that was raised in the small, regionally southern town by conservative Christian family. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes think that you got to give people credit when they come from a place where it was harder for their minds to be open than people who were born by parents with open minds. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a lot of extra work. They don't know, again, like we said, they don't know what they don't know. Right. And so there has to be some grace. I know we don't want to say that it, right now. Everybody's, you know, but there has to be some grace. Well, there's, because- there's the, the whole thing of like, if you disagree with somebody, instead of just saying you're wrong, you don't understand, like that immediately puts them on the defensive and you're never going to get anywhere. But when you disagree with somebody, I think the next step should just be, well, tell, tell me why you think that way. And then you get into an actual conversation. That's more like, give me your information versus I'm attacking you with mine. Right, exactly. And can I tell you what I just learned about that thing you're talking about? Right. Here's some facts. We're going to take a short break. Stay tuned for more of the episode. I just had a, I, I will tell you, I just had a, um, a political conversation with family in the kitchen. Um, And we saw things very differently. And I, all I did was there was no judgment. It was simply, well, based on what you're saying here, you're ignoring the fact that in blankety blank year, this happened. Or did you know that this, I mean, really, I got to tell you, Alan, this podcast and all this historical information is really serving me in those like political <laughs> family arguments. <laughs> <laughs> like, really, I was saying, I was talking about the ERA to a woman who was, um, believed very different things than me. I was saying, do you know that in the constitution, women are not considered equal? that we can still be discriminated against because of our gender. And I said, it says in there, all men are created equal. Well, if that's applying to women as well, then why couldn't women vote until 1920? Mm -hmm. Why did it, why was it that Victoria Woodhull, who was actually a presidential candidate when she couldn't even legally vote, said, well, it says all men are created equal. So ladies, Let's hit, let's hit the booths, let's hit the voting booths, and let's all vote. And so there were, there were some suffragists that believed that since it said this in the Constitution, they should legally be able to vote. So they went, and they got arrested. That's why we have to change the Constitution to say that we cannot be discriminated against because of gender. Yeah, RBG was so instrumental in, in all of this because, again... From my point of view, I didn't know that if I were a female or my counterpart of if me, if you clone me and make and make the clone a female, that we would be have such a, a different subset of rights or mm-hmm. discrimination or whatever the case is. And it, it baffles me. It blows my mind how much not, not only did it ex, did it exist originally, but how recently it changed. And even though it's changed, how much still hasn't changed at all? Because then you go, you go to certain parts of the country, you go to certain parts of the world, and I know. it's and it's just completely different, completely messed up. So coming back, coming back to you, you're trying to know what you don't know, but then coming from, I feel like sort of the opposite end, like the pageant scene. It's all about the looks. It's all about the money. It's all about all of the. It's like you've done a complete 180, right? And I didn't know you didn't finish college, and you mentioned that you have like guilt about. You know, with your dad, your dad wants you to have a college education. I did get an honorary degree from Michigan State University when I taught acting for them. Did you? Well, then (laughs) coming coming from the world that is so looks and superficial, then I feel like 
maybe I just don't know enough people that have come from that world, but a lot of people, I, or I, what I see from the outside too, right, is just how many Instagram followers do I have? How many people like this post? How many people think I'm pretty in this particular thing? Or I look good and my six pack abs are, are reflecting the light in a way that makes my ears not wiggle, right? So <laughs> all of these things put together, while at the same time looking over your bio, you've got all of these all of the these things of just incredible activism and strength and you've you've created your own production company where you're doing sketch comedy and all the stuff that has nothing to do with basically the fundamentals of how you were raised as a kid and i guess what i'm trying to a ask is how much of that is conscious of just trying to separate yourself and i guess when did you sort of realize the irony of what your what your activism is trying to get across now versus who you are as a kid, right? So I think I think what I realized really quickly was that modeling was really boring. And that I it wasn't fun. But acting was fun and dancing was fun and singing was fun. And I remember like I was very good at mimicking as a child and mostly accents. Like I would hear accents, like especially like coming from Kentucky to New York. And I walked home with like a bunch of different dialects after that first summer and I would do them and people would laugh and they thought it was funny when I would impersonate. And I was like, Oh, this feels much better than being pretty. Like, I much prefer getting a laugh than getting an applause. Hmm. And I don't know where that just, like, that was, like, so much more fun to make, because that felt like people genuinely getting a sense of joy. And to be, like, a cut up, cut up and to be goofy and to make a fool out of myself started to become uh, what the more of who I was. But I still... Uh, of course, you know, was raised by a woman who was raised by another woman that's like, oh, I don't have my face on, you know, and the the way things appeared on the outside uh, took precedence to the way that your insides shine outward. And so, but my father was very, very focused on internal beauty internal beautification and asked me what the meaning of life was at five years old. And that conversation continued till the day he died. So there was this part of me where I think that the sort of deeper parts of me were instilled by my father and the goofball was just that I liked to get that attention. And then it, it began to evolve in terms of my artistry and having ideas. And I love to create and that's when I feel the most connected to God. I guess if we're <laughs> we're talking about the Bible already, we can talk about it again. Um, I believe that when the Bible says we're created um, in God's image, that's not does not mean that God also has a face or is like looks like Ariel's dad. <laughs> Lord Triton in the sky with a pitchfork like Zeus or something like that. It's that we are creative too. And when we get out of our own way, when we sort of dispel our own fear, uh, when we get self-doubt, we just allow those moments of inspiration, those ideas to come, then we expand the universe. We I create. love it. You know, so that's what I like to do. That's my connection. That's like, that's my creativity is my spirituality. I was going to ask you what your idea of spirituality is. And literally, that was my next question. And I, I agree. I agree with that. I'm going to add to that and also say my, my spirituality is, is going on emotional journeys with strangers that, that whatever that energy is when you're sitting in an audience and you 
everyone's crying or everyone's laughing or you just feel like people people all the time performers are like the energy of the room the room takes on the energy of the people in it collectively or when you walk into a when you walk into a room or you you're walking to somewhere and all of a sudden you've never met somebody before but you you know them and wh whatever that is i don't know what that is if scientifically there's probably a reason and in 100 years maybe we'll figure out what it is if we haven't destroyed the planet by then but we've got the ability to connect with people in a way that are tuned into the same frequency. That to me is spirituality. I agree with that. So one of my beliefs is that um, has to do with the fact that this life is a sensory experience and that our life prior and post this physical life is not. And the only thing that makes us believe and know that we're separate from each other is our five senses. The fact that I can see and hear you, that I can feel that I'm different from you. But if I didn't have my five senses, like if I literally was like closing my eyes right now and just in darkness, I wouldn't know where I ended and you began or that my hand, if I could not feel that my hand hit this desk, I would believe that my energy went through it. Mm -hmm. So the reality is that we are all one. Having this experience together, but that our five senses are telling us that we are separate. One of the things that was really interesting about the developmental books I was reading about motherhood are, is that newborns don't know they're separate from you. Oh. Until they're almost two that well well one and they the toddler years is when they're figuring out that they are a whole separate entity and that's where a lot of that um separation anxiety comes in and then that's also where that sense of independence comes in when they're like two and they're like mine yours mine yours like they they know that well they never say yours they just say mine <laughs> mine mine, <laughs> mine <laughs> no mine no but but they know the difference but I was like, whoa, how cool is that? Because I'd had that belief that, that we're really all connected. Uh, I think when we get past the pretense, which isn't just our five senses now, we've created, um, you know, stories. Each and every one of us has a story. And that story is... Uh, created deep, deep beliefs and habits, and they continue to get reinforced. Mm -hmm. And then we see these patterns in our lives we don't want anymore. And a lot of that time is that we believe, it's a lot of the reason for that is that we believe our story. Collectively, we have stories. A lot of these stories, in, and this is ironic coming from me who is just talking about women's stories, but a lot of these stories can our personal stories and this can keep us from the connection. But when we get down to the root of it, it's all about the truth, right? When we're on stage, the truth is what connects us with our other actors. It connects us with our material and it connects us with the audience when we speak the truth and we, and we are truthful in our performance. When we are truthful about our collective stories, um, we can connect when we begin to tell the truth and acknowledge the truth, we then can connect. And at the source of that is love and collective suffering, which is a very Buddhist concept, but it is true. We've got a couple of constants in life. Those are change and those are suffering. And there is no change without suffering. I was going to say truth also comes with vulnerability. Because you have to, to be truthful, especially in a painful moment, it's vulnerable. It's very vulnerable. And if you're doing that eight times Terrifying. a week, eight Terrifying. times a week, come on. But you know what? I always found being an actor was a little less scary to be vulnerable and tell the truth because I was tell I was only reveal I was revealing these parts of myself ho housed inside of a character. Right. It really wasn't until I was writing a lot of music 
where I was like, ooh, now this is scary because they know I'm writing about myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but again, I believe, and this is so interesting that you say this because one of the things that I truly believe as a songwriter is if you, it has to scare you to write it. It needs to terrify you that you admitted this. The greatest comedians say the things that everybody else was afraid to say. Yeah. And the greatest songwriters do it too. And the greatest art, the greatest authors, playwrights, everybody. But when we go to the place that terrifies us to admit, which requires pushing through our fear, requires vulnerability, that's the biggest payoff in terms of connection with our audience, but also the greatest relief. I mean, the greatest relief. And I, I, would, I would find that in any relationship, even with my husband, like when I finally admit, yeah, it was me. I did the thing. I did, it. <laughs> I did that thing that I've been saying I haven't been doing it. I did it. And it's like, oh, wait, I was terrifying. I pooped a little when I admitted it. But I feel so much better. And even if it's the smallest thing, and my, my husband's awesome because he laughs every time. I knew it. You know, and then it, you know, and then it just, and then it dispels it and we laugh and we move on. It's the biggest problems we have with people are the ones that can admit. Right. The truth. Right, right. They're afraid, oh. you know, people are afraid of the truth because they're, they're, they're afraid to not be perfect. They're afraid to fail. And ironically, their failure is the inability. That's something, that's something I personally had to get over. With, with my close friends and the people I'm in, I've been in relationships with is, is the more I care about somebody, I, I fell into this trap of holding more back because I was more and more afraid that being, by being vulnerable, they wouldn't like what they see or they wouldn't, they wouldn't want, they wouldn't accept me for, with mistakes anymore. Like when you don't care about a friendship or not, not a friendship, but you don't care about like ultimately um, somebody that, that you don't have to spend a lot of time with, right? It, the standards that you hold yourself to, I think are a lot more, at least for me, were a lot more lax because I'm like, oh, you know, they don't know me so much. It's, it's not this culmination of, of mistake after mistake, or I feel like I'm about to make mistakes all the time. And I'm just afraid that the people that care about me will eventually see kind of what a hack that I feel like I am. Right. Every single one of us is a hack. We are constantly making mistakes. This is the thing that I definitely know for sure is that um, the biggest mistakes we make are the risks we don't take. And the greatest lessons we learn are from the mistakes we make. Yes. <laughs> but, but I wouldn't, but to not take the risk is, is uh, you don't really learn much from that. Do you know? All right, so we wrap up every episode with three standard closing questions. The first one, very simply, is what motivates you? Well, I think love motivates everyone. The need for love motivates everyone. Um, and our habits and our patterns get formed as a result of in what way we go about getting that love. Uh, so whether, whether your base human emotion is fear of abandonment or need for approval that will be your way about going for, or any other base human emotion, um, that'll be your way of, of, of looking for love. So for me, I think what motivates me, you know, by saying, I say that it obviously love is motivating, connection is motivating, um, because those things make me feel good. And, uh, so yeah, on some level, I'm hedonistic and I want to feel good. I want to have fun and I want to feel love. And I get those things by being creative. And I, I get those that. things by being with my friends and family. And I also love the element of surprise because that to me is fun. <laughs> um, right, right. So yeah, so I, I would say I'm motivated by um, what inspires me and the ideas that I have. And lately, obviously, the, the things that you and I have been working on with the podcast and, 
and the album is I'm motivated about educating and empowering women and to get the right information. I'm motivated in that way too. So lots of things motivate me. I don't have any reason not to get out of bed. I'll tell you that. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. You are always busy. And the kid, the kid, Huck won't let you sleep anyway in the morning. Yeah. Sometimes I just (laughs) want to watch TV, but you know. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Okay. So second question is what advice would you give to your younger self and younger people listening now starting out down a similar path? Well, I really believe after 35 years of being in this business and having a professional performing career that as an actor, performer, artist, you have never arrived. There is always something to learn. Mm. And that the point has evolved into, for me, growing, learning, and not being perfect. So I think for a lot of people, it's like, one day I'm going to be on that billboard and starring in that show. I'm going to get that award. I'm going to say, I did it. I know best and nobody knows better than me. And what I've learned is that you never know everything. There is always something to learn. And the goal should be the growth because then everything, even the kind of uncomfortable bad stuff is serving you. It's teaching you something. And especially as an actor, when you're supposed to be able to connect with characters who are awful uh, and experiences that uh, have conflict, you need conflict in Mm. life. You need to have a variety of experiences to better understand human behavior. And so even your pain, especially your pain, is usable. Um, And your mistakes are required. I like that. So that's that's my big lesson is just like, go with it. (laughs) Go with the flow. (laughs) Learn what you need to learn. All right. So the last question, this is the hardest one. If you could only stop see. Resisting. One, stop resisting. If stop you could resisting. only s- <laughs> If you could only see one show for the rest of your life, but you can see it as many times as you want, what would you see? Oh, no. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> You're stuck on an island. Ugh. Everything you need to live and be happy. And you have a DVD player with power. (laughs) And you have one show on that DVD. What show is it? Oh, a show. I thought you meant Broadway show. It could be anything. Anything. Whatever you want it to be. Not that this is my favorite. But I do think that Hamilton is so freaking dense that it would take me a long time to be able to absorb all that information and learn the show. So I could say that show. Um, Just because... I would be entertained for a while, or at least I would be, uh, I would have, I wouldn't be ahead of it. Right. I'm thinking Alan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It would have to be funny if I was, if I had to watch it forever, but then I would get sick of the jokes. Um, something with improv whose line, whose line is it anyway? Uh, that's or a pretty fun joke. Free, freestyle freestyle of Supreme. I have to tell you, Like, I really like stylized period type shows. So I like things like Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And I'm just sort of fascinated with the design. It's so like juicy and fun for me. I love those (laughs) types of shows. Um, Something with a musical element would be really nice. I got, I don't know. It's okay. don't, Don't stress yourself. Don't stress yourself. It's fine. You All right. What? So okay. I'll tell you, if I had to be stuck alone on a desert island and I couldn't watch anything ever again, except for this, the Carol Burnett show. <laughs> <laughs> That's that would be it. The Carol Burnett show or like SNL, because then yes. I would be if you let me see like every single episode of SNL from the beginning of, of it. What a study on comedy, too. Oh, yeah. And how it's like, evolved. 45 years of, of sketch comedy. Yeah. Oh, that would, that would be a lot of fun. 
I love sketch comedy. I also love bad talent videos on YouTube. <laughs> and I could also just watch or like plays gone wrong mishaps. That is my fave. I live. I live for a mishap. Oh, I too. live for a note gone wrong. That's I. I have to say I am a fan of the streaming, of the streaming society that we are in, and the on demand this and everything. But I miss the bloopers that used to come with DVDs. That was the, that's the whole point for me of still getting a DVD when when you could still get them easily is because of all the bloopers and the outtakes. Well, I think they probably because what I'm noticing now is that most television shows have their own YouTube channels. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that some of them do show bloopers. So I think they're still out there because I know every single television show I've ever done at the end of the season, we have a party and they always show a blooper reel. Yeah. Yeah. They always show a blooper reel and they try to feature everybody that's been in the show. And then you were like, <laughs> I had one where I was like, oh, that's the only thing they had of me. And I'm like, mm, I'm really good that year. I didn't make any mistakes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but like, you want to have, you want to make the blooper reel. So you need right. to kind of like get it wrong a couple times. There that are some chances. really, I live for a blooper reel too. I yeah, love yeah. that stuff. So where can we find you online and where can we get the album? Well, um, you can find me, uh, at, at Laura Bell Bundy on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Um, <laughs> you're, on, you're on TikTok now? I am. Listen, when you oh are boy. a recording artist, you have to be on TikTok. Um, <laughs> I started out pretty strong on TikTok. I did like a parody of, uh, mama's got a pump, mama's got a nurse mama's got to you know yeah yeah of, of moms and then it kind of went down from there because it really <laughs> does require it requires a lot of time and you some you creative ideas mama's got a pump so the album women of tomorrow is available on itunes spotify amazon pandora youtube wherever you get your music and uh and the podcast is available on the broadway podcast network fm slash W-O-T for Women of Tomorrow. It's a great what? podcast. What? 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 With Laura Bell Bundy. Mm -hmm. You can get more of me at thetheaterpodcast.com. I'm on Instagram and Twitter at theater underscore podcast. Please leave a rating, leave a review, share with your friends. Thank you to Jukebox the Ghost for the intro and outro music. And Laura Bell, thank you so much. This has been such a long and fun and exciting <laughs> conversation. I every time I talk to you, I learn more about just the world and what everybody should know. You are such an amazing person. Well, thanks, Alan. Um, I don't know that much, but uh, I told you everything I know on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're the best and I love working with you. And um, this has really been fun. Thank you. Take a deep breath, make the world a little colorful.